Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And um, <laughs> I see uh, uh, Group Captain Norford there saluting. Thank you, sir. And um, welcome to everybody. Um, today, of course, we've got a terrific presentation by uh, Lance Hal uh, Halverson. And we've got a couple of um, a couple of unusual ring-ins. We've got uh, Adam uh, Halverson. Uh, greetings, Adam. I understand from what um, what your dad was saying that you weren't even around when he did all these things. So that's a good thing that you're going to find out about it and um, and, and get the story off him. We were hoping to have uh, Lance's son uh, Carl uh, tuning from the from Washington DC, but it doesn't look like he's coming in at this yet. Of course, it's still it's still the day before over over where he is. So, um, and he's uh, he works in from what um, uh, uh, Lance was telling me he's uh, he's worked all over the world as a as a chef and uh, ended up in the United States and uh, married a married a girl from the US and um, but Lance wants him to come home so come <laughs> home Carl so if he if he if he tunes in we'll, we can all say in unison come home Carl so and uh, just for interest where, uh, Andrew where are you at the moment you've been travelling around around places some. Um, doing some interesting places, I understand. Uh, I'm currently in downtown Howard Springs in my quarantine facility. Oh, fabulous. fabulous. My bed's sort of made. Oh, gosh. Yeah. gosh. Oh, no, we just came in from El, uh, El Minhad. We brought back some of the Afghan evacuees. Um, Qantas is doing about six or seven flights to assist the Air Force. Um, yeah, and then I head to Frankfurt tonight just to bring some more Aussies home from Europe. Well, thank you for all your efforts there, Andrew. That's fantastic. And the room at Howard Springs. Weeks of quarantine, loving it. <laughs> well, it looks just like the um, the transit accommodation at Richmond, so it shouldn't be too <laughs> hard for you to take. So, <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of us would be very familiar with that layer, and I bet they've got rubber rubber on the mattresses. Okay, then, folks. Well, as I say, uh, we've got Lance back today. Um, we thought uh, he did such a good job last time that we would call him back again. And just for some of the that may not have um, come in before. Um, just a bit of a rundown on Lance. Um, he joined the Permanent Air Force in 1962 as a navigator, graduated in August 63 as a pilot officer navigator and posted to Ambly um, and uh, did his conversion onto Canberra's. Um, completed flying hours on the Canberra bombers at Ambly and Butterworth, Malaya, before going before deploying to South Vietnam. Uh, after Vietnam, he went to the USA, trained as a weapons systems officer on the F-111. With US Air Force returned to Australia in, in um, 1968. He, he um, loved the place so much and uh, that it went back in 1970, trained us on the Phantom F 4E strike fighter in Arizona and Florida before ferrying the aircraft across the Pacific to Australia in October. Uh, completed the advanced nav course um, and then after completing his second F 11 conversion at Ambly in December 74. Completed a weapons course at the Royal Air Force College um, at Cranbourne, in the UK. Returned to Amley again as a weapons systems officer on F 111s, a six squadron, um, and then three years as a weapons officer at the headquarters. Um, then spent three years part of Defence Canberra. That must have been exciting after all that um, all that uh, time flying, Lance. Uh, where he was staff officer on the F 111 requirements and programs office. And that's where he was awarded, um, was made uh, a member of the um, his Empire MBE in 1980 for his work on in analysing the performance of the F-111 weapons in while at Amber. I did the Joint Staff Course, served as, served as a Staff Officer Operations Planning at um, Air Headquarters at Glenville. Then he became Staff Officer to Sir Neville McNamara, um, in fact, his last Staff Officer, retired in 1985 worked as a systems manager at Emergency Management Australia for 13 years before working as an IT contractor in the commercial world. Founding member of the Sir Richard Williams Foundation in 2008. Uh, as executive officer until he retired from that position in 2014. President of the ACT Division of the Air Force Association, then became Vice President of Communications and Media National Council for Air Force Association and was, and was um, uh, editor of Wings Magazine for a long time. Uh, he's Lance is a life member of the Air Force Association and still webmaster of the ACT division, and he lives in Canberra with his wife Heather. And it sounds it sounds like his sons are scattered all over the world, so um, we should come home and spend some time. With right. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much, um, Lance, for coming back again. And as I said, we so enjoyed your first presentation. I'm looking forward to this one. So, what I'll do, I will mute you all. Thanks, Marianne.
warning everybody, it makes me wonder where I fit it all that in. <laughs> but it's a good few years I've had. Maybe I want to do it all again. As the Chief of Air Force said, you only get one go at that. So you've got to make the best of it. Everybody can hear me okay? All right, thanks, Peter. Good show. Therefore, Phantom in RAF service. Most people have not heard of the Phantom in RAF service, but uh, we only had it for three years. And I can assure you it was a great three years for the Phantom and guys who were fortunately enough to fly at that time. I didn't have three years on it, but about 18 months. The Phantom. What's the origin of the Phantom? As you can see, it started out with US Navy aircraft back way back in 1961. It was a fleet fighter, actually, multi-role fighter. US Air Force Dick designated it as the F-110, but the US Navy couldn't handle that. So it went back to the F-4. It had many various models. Earned the piece that had the world's speed record at low level. And when I say low level, it was 150 feet. Did mark 1.25, which is 780 knots. That's 150 feet above the desert. And it was called a sage burner and it really moved and it took the world low level speed record for many years and i don't think many other aircraft could go as fast the 111 could of course that's another story at high altitude it can go to mark 2.6 but we only ever flew it to mark 2 but not as a normal normal role it was just a, a checkout test it was the mainstay of the Western forces as see, they built a large number of the aircraft. American air power in Vietnam and the Middle East in later years. Quite a few roles, US Air Force and Navy, lost in combat losses in Vietnam, 380 to a total of 445. Powerful aircraft. When we got it, it was revered by air and ground crews it, because it's, it was survivable. It was very reliable and it was durable, extremely. How did the RAF come to get the Phantom? Well, we had problems with the F-111. I was training in the USA and we had a few problems. We all checked out on the F-111s in 1968, pilots and navs. The wing carry through box and the wing pivot fitting had a few problems. So our government decided they wouldn't take it until it was redesigned and made 100% airworthy. Well, that was pretty hard to get 100%. The US government was also worried about our capability loss. So Malcolm Fraser then was the Minister of Defence, Defence Secretary Laird, Kennedy Grant will lease the Phantoms did all the training in USA and US assist us in ferrying to Australia. The cost, as you can see, was $34 million for two years, but if we wanted to keep them there after with another 12 million, if required, that's a different story. Transition plan, how do we plan all this? One June to four October 70, that the plan was to Go to the US, train, ferry him home, all within that time frame. And it worked. Tech staff were being trained at Emily. 24 pilots were chosen. They went to the Florida to do the flying training. 10 NAVs, of which I was one of them, went to Arizona. And then we did, went off to Florida to train, the flying training at Medellin, Florida. We picked the aircraft up from the factory in St. Louis and ferried them home. And see, there's a picture of all the wee guys at MacDill. I'm down the bottom end of the far right, this bloke here, young Halverson. The initial crews uh, for the 111 program were grabbed basically for the Air 4 training. 
the requirement then was for one living train pilots or Mirage pilots and then or Canberra, Canberra pilots. Navigators uh, insisted that we uh, first bunch were one living train, there were 10 of us, or off Canberra's or Herc's or uh, Orion's. I don't know where they came in. Mac Air was the factory we was called, it's now McDonnell Douglas. It's St. Louis, 1970, the year we picked them up. They were pushing out 72 of these aircraft every month. We visited the factory. They were built like locomotives. They were solid, brutish and uncouth sort of aircraft. People loved them. F4 training. Pilots went to McDillon, Florida, and they flew for 35 hours flying. They did the conversion, weapons delivery, the normal things that one would do, air intercepts, air refueling. And then we then they did crew flights with the wee navs when we got there. We did 20 hours flying at McDill. And there we, there the, the types of flying we did down the bottom. Air intercept, air refueling was heavily involved. Weapons delivery, of course. And then we do a, a crew checkouts with uh, new RAF pilots who trained and converted to the aircraft and uh, we nurse. Now we just did their first training in Davis Monthan. Uh, we did four weeks on the weapon systems training. As you can just as, as, as an aside, the aircraft you can see down the bottom there, that's um, it's commonly called the Boneyard at Davis Monthan in out of Tucson in Arizona anywhere between four and five, sometimes five and a half, six thousand aircraft, which the Americans called in, in the boneyard, it's called AMARG, the Aircraft Maintenance and Redistribution Group. They refurbish all the aircraft if needed, or they chop them up. You can see there are a lot of, air, a lot of phantoms in there. All the F-111s are, <coughs> are there. B-58 hustlers, B-52s, everything you can think about. Aircraft are all there. The aircraft, without doubt, the, the Phantom was one of the most famous aircraft in the Hall of Fame, certainly with the USAF and with us. It had a great combat record, Vietnam, Middle East. It was the mainstay of the Western Alliance Air Force for over 20 years. Many called the aircraft brutish and uncouth or mean and ugly and it was but it was a fast powerful mark ii aircraft served in many roles that have indicated earlier we're fortunate enough to have operated these as interim aircraft in numbers one and six ones i was in six one with cf first year was roy frost second one was alan reed while we're waiting for the F-111C, which came along quite a bit later, 1973, actually. Briefly, uh, that's the weapon systems interface and training we did in, in Davis Month. It's a pretty basic aeroplane or aircraft. It was a Navy aircraft. On the left-hand side, you see the weapons at the navigation computer. It's the same navigation system that was fitted to the P3Bs. <clears throat> Display might have been a bit different, but they were the tie in the interfaces. It had an inertial navigation system. For those who don't know what inertial nav systems are, they equip every modern aircraft, civil and military to this day and have done for the last 20 years. Briefly, they measure the acceleration of the vehicle. And the first integral of acceleration is velocity, and the second integral is distance gone. That formed the basis of the navigation system. The 111 had exactly the same. All modern aircraft have inertial navigation systems. Not as steam driven as the ones we had there. These were electromechanical high speed gyros. The current modern day ones are laser ring gyros. Different technology, same principles. Just a quick aside, 
while we're trying to get Florida, we went across to Cape Canaveral, as it was called then. Now, well, Cape Kennedy was called then. Now it's Cape Canaveral. We looked at the, we are hoping to get a launch of the Apollo 15, but we only saw it. <clears throat> One of our pilots uh, on the squadron, his brother-in-law was an Australian, an astronaut in training, and he eventually went off in one of the launches, I'm not sure which one. But we went up into the VAB here, the vert Vertical Assembly Building, where they assembled the Apollo 15. We went up in the lift to the, to the module, 36 stories. It was a monstrous building. They then moved the, the, the fabricated installed rocket system and module out to the launch site on the right-hand side here in massive tractors going one eighth of a mile per hour travel. And it used to take three hours to get from there to the launch site. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see a launch, but that was part of the, part of the, the visit at, to McDill that was uh, not far from Cape Canaveral. Anyway, getting back to the Phantom, we went and picked the aircraft up on the flight line at Mac Air in St. Louis, Missouri. They're all brand new, brand new aircraft. There's a bunch of them lined up. How did we get them back to Australia? Well, CO, the sixth one at the time, Roy Frost, anyone at F-111 trained and Mirage pilots have ferried the aircraft. 111 trained navigators only. I happen to be one of those. Broke them up to four ferry flights, six aircraft each. And each flight of six, had four KC-135 tankers. We'd have a tanker and two Air Force, another tanker, two Air Force, and the last pair of aircraft had a tanker to themselves and one spare. That was for each of the flights, about a, uh, a week apart. And we flew from the Mac Air factory in St. Louis to Costa George Air Force Base, short trip, and there are the number of air refuelings we had along the way and the, the flight times on our way to Ambly. Quick map of where these things are in relation to California. See on the far right with the red arrow, that's Tucson where we trained on the Davis Monthan for the 111 navs before we went across to Florida, which is way across the east coast of USA. Picked up the aircraft in St. Louis. We flew them to George Air Force Base here overnighted and interestingly George Air Force Base now is where a lot of the called generally Victorville where a lot of the civil aircraft because of the COVID are parked there are literally hundreds of them there there's our route route flew out of Los Angeles picked up the tankers rendezvous over Oakland and then across the Pacific <clears throat> or part of the Pacific, to Higgum Air Force Base, four air to air refuelings en route, five and a half hours, or 5.6, where we overnighted. I was on the fourth ferry on the 23rd aircraft, that's the picture of the 24th aircraft. Uh, Brendan Roberts is the pilot of that. I took the picture out of my aircraft, of course. That's the route across the Pacific. He came across to Guam and then down the tankers turned around about, around about Cairns and headed back to Guam. Interesting, for comparison, I've shown the route, the route taken by the F-111 ferries. <clears throat> the first lot of ferries went by Pango Pango, just in here and across. The third ferry, because it, there was problems getting fuel in Pango Pango, they flew to Fiji. And as one of the guys said, I wasn't on the ferry, because one of the guys said, it was quite an interesting flight getting into Fiji. They got in there late hours of the afternoon. The UHF radio had broken down the tower, so they had to re relay into landing instructions via a P3 sitting on the tarmac. In the middle of a thunderstorm, low on fuel and no augment. 
So it meant you get in or they ain't going anywhere. They all got in safely. Later, later on when we flew at 111's, a slight digression, going back and forth to RIMPAC in, in the USA, we used to fly out of Ambly across to Kwajalein, up in the middle of the marshals and across there. That took off a long distance. But the Americans had a cross here and they used to call it cross flying aircraft to USA, oil burner routes. So they had tankers and aircraft going across the Pacific all the time. The last two aircraft that I was uh, on in, 23rd and 24th. Unfortunately, we went US in uh, Hickam, so we had to stay overnight. And the other four went on without us. So we stayed on. And unfortunately, there was a Mongolian barbecue on, on the officers' pub that night, but so we, we had to be careful what we did eat because it was seven and a half hours on that flight. And in a phantom, there's nowhere to go. There's the route on the way. These pictures taken out of out of the tanker to show you how close the aircraft does get to the tanker for air refueling and the receptacle back here, right above the navigator's head. So they're very close. But the guys, I flew with the ex uh, US Air Force Thunderbird pilot, and he was one of the best pilots the air refueling that I've ever seen. The guys would never, the old aim of the air refueling was the, a bunch of uh, director lights underneath the tanker. Caution, green and red lights, that, which is flow out on the tanker, not the boom. Interesting flying. Back in Australia, New crews who didn't go on the ferry, they trained in Davis Mountain as well, but they had to do the aircraft conversion back in back in Australia with six foot converted to the all crews. Then we all did additional training in Emily. We took the aircraft up to Mark II. Clean, of course. We did more air, air in, radar intercepts, weapons training, strafing, gunnery, formation. I'll talk a bit more about the gunnery shortly uh, before we uh, were then declared operational. It was a new era at Amberley. But everywhere we used to go, we'd fly in a four ship formation or in a pair, which is most unheard of for most navigators and cameras and subsequently on 111. Find what's called battle formation. Close up only for about one and a half, 1.7, two hours. Not out of fuel by then. Close up in, in a close formation and pitch out at Amberley. Always flew with the three set, these tanks you can see on the wing, wing pylon stations. Two 370 gallon tanks. Always flew with those, except when we were going supersonic, which was only initial checking, checking out. And they used to carry a big 600 gallon tank, which you can't see there, for ferry and deployment. And then in, in travel, like we did coming back, we also carried a travel pod. Travel pod was a checked out tank where you could put your baggage things. And I carried baggage in that and a Tonka truck from my oldest son. So it was good. But the biggest problem with, with that is when you got to your destination, They've been cold soaked for five or six hours and everything was freezing cold. You couldn't put any clothes or anything on until it thawed out. When we got to Ambly, we did dive bombing, 60, 45, 30 degree. Usually with a, four aircraft in the range at the time. So you have four aircraft in the pattern. Day and night, although we'd only do 30 degree dive bombing at night, rolling in about 13,000 feet, pick up the target, Dive one, released by four and a half thousand feet, pull out, 4G pull. Some people got target fixation. See how at the time, Alan Reid used to get target fixation, which is not good at night. So navigators used to watch that ultimate very closely. The, one, the F4 Phantom didn't have any all weather 
attack capability like the, the F-111 had. Radar was not a ground mapping radar, it was an air intercept radar. And it was no good for ground mapping. So most of it was visual day bombing or visual at night, low angle, 30 degree. It's to do very skip bombing, low down, skip bombing at 600 feet and gunnery. Well, gunnery targets at uh, Evans Head, down to 500 feet, low angle. With a foul line of about 1,800 feet and the sound of a M61A1 gun, which fires at 6,000 rounds a minute, is something else. We used to, we pulled the rounds, they had a rounds limiter switch on so you couldn't get rid of all your ammo straight away. And we backed the rate of fire off. Because all the expended ammo was carried on board, we didn't throw it overboard. And so you had to good, have a good gun purging system. You can probably just see a nose thing here. Like you have to have a good gun purging system because at that rate of fire, there's a lot of gas generated and stored in the aircraft. So you have to purge the gases out. And a lot of the rounds used to, there'd be an overrun of rounds, 30 to 40 rounds and throw into the expended ammo bin. So the last thing you want is any of those to cook off. And one did on an F-111 later on, years later, not one of ours, but US Air Force, and they lost it. So you have to be pretty careful. You fly, the aim was to fly, flying with Dave Rogers, the aim was to fly 50 rounds, about 50 rounds. And that was just a, a 500 millisecond touch of the, the gun button. And it really fired. Great. Somebody called it great fun. That's an aircraft there, the T-34. There's a bit quick brief story in a, in, a, in a minute. That's the one that I ferried back with the US Air Force pilot. And it's the one that dinged on the runway when the cable broke. Deployments exercise. We deployed exercises a number of times all over the place. This particular one was the Jubilee Air Display in 71, went to all the bases. This is our team at, uh, at um, Townsville, I think it is. Once again, I'm the young bloke down the end on the right. I always seem to get to the end of the, end of the lineup. Young Dave Rogers there and Roy Frost and Frank Burke, a few other guys that people probably don't remember, Marty Susans. Roy Frost, Dave Rogers. The Jubilee air displays were great. The draw card all over the countryside. We went to every base. Well, we did share it with one squadron. They went to some of the bases. We, this one, we went to a, a large number. We shared it. Deployments. This is an ex, this is a 1972 air show at Piers. The year after our Jubilee displays, four aircraft from six one taxiing in with a real so This is at Piers. You see the big 600 gallon tank there. We had to use that for fairing. To get to Piers, had to fly via from Amberley to Alice Springs and then to Piers because going too far south is too many headwinds. None out of fuel. Deployments meant the exercise top limit. As in typical of all these things, cartoons come out everywhere. It's a cartoon with supposedly a, a, an F4, but that's in a Mirage. We, uh, the Mirage have had a lot of trouble keeping up with Phantoms. And there's many story of Mirages breaking the sound barrier at two or 300 feet trying to catch a Phantom. And also years later, trying to catch your F-111s. Here's a couple of photos. Every, Every, wherever you went in the Phantoms, there's a pair's takeoff. We'd find two pairs and we'd join up as a four, fly as a, a, finger, a fin, right hand finger four formation. But everything was done fighter pilot wise. Pairs, four ships. That's not one of our Phantoms, it's a US Air Force Phantom. And the purpose of it is very, very, very low, as you can see. And the purpose there is to check out the acoustic the recorders down the bottom of the picture. 
um, it worked. They drove the needles and the, the sound levels off, off the scale. It was so low. You really exercised the sound recorders. Flying the aircraft was uh, quite a bit different. It had so much power on the engines, you couldn't run up full on brakes, full power with both afterburners because the tyres would rotate down the rims. So to run each engine up separately. And then release the brakes and to go off like a scalded cat. This is, of course, this is on, on a landing configuration. It had what's called a blown leading edge and trailing edge flaps. That's um, to, to uh, increase the lift and smooth out the laminar flow over the wings. Uh, interesting for the aircraft, got an outer wing dihedral on the wings and they folded there. We didn't fold ours, they could fold there for Navy version. It had down ailerons, they're flaps down there, flaps and up for spoilers, most unusual, and anhedral slabs. So it was the most ugliest looking aircraft you could ever see. Anhedral, dihedral, all sorts of things. And every week we wonder how it could ever fly, but it did. Climb, performance was outstanding. Flying out of Ambly, claim we could accelerate to 600 knots and be doing 600 knots, with people know Ambly at all, but halfway, but probably about 500 metres past the end of the runway, clean, it'd be doing 600 knots. It was so fast. And you'd pull up 85 degree climb and climb very rapidly. Supersonic at high altitude, so we didn't do that very often, just to check it out to see that it could do that. Low level, high speed, the tanks were cleared up to Mark 1. The eight and a half G limit at low level. Anywhere, adverse yaw was a bit of a problem with the aircraft. Had no limitations on the engines. It was just incredible. Had a few incidents with the aircraft. Pilot induced oscillations was a problem, often called the JCs. A couple of times the guys blew a tire. On the tires are very high pressure. If you landed very heavily, uh, you can blow a tire. One memorable occasion, one of the guys, pilot name unknown, uh, well, I do know who it was, to touch and go on the, on, the, on the go around, put up the gear, found the gear had already, was already up. He touched down on the, on, the on the tanks and didn't know it. T-35 had a major problem and then we lost another one. Lost one at uh, guys are killed. They were trying, uh, uh, leaving the range at Evans Head at night, doing a visual rejoin, 2,000 feet. They were cleared to 1,000. And people who've flown at night, doing a visual rejoin is pretty hard work. Uh, you can misjudge the altitude very, very easily. Uh, and it looks like he did. The navigator, who knows, you normally check the altimeter and the low altitude radio altimeter. You make, when you're that close to the water at night, you make sure you're watching all the instruments, but whatever the reason, they hit the water and were killed. They're coming in the landing, you can see the aircraft in the configuration. <clears throat> it's coming to pitch out at uh, 350 knots, 4G in the downwind, and then 175 knots for the gear and turning the base, set 160 knots, and it used to fly on the angle of attack indexes. The, this aircraft and the Century Series fighters and the 111 never, never rounded out. It then set up a, an alpha on the in, indexes, 10 degree, and it just fly it down at 800 feet, later a minute descent and hit the runway. And that's how this system, that's how they flew. And used to pop the chute. 
you can stop the aircraft in 1500 feet. Not much fuel on board, of course. C-34, I, was in the, I wasn't in this aircraft, but I was in the formation. Uh, they had a, a generator failure and uh, standard practice with that because they lost the nose wheel steering and anti-skid. They took an approach end engagement, took up the hook cable, you can see on the top here, just the hook cable oscillated, came unlatched, ran out and broke and sent the aircraft off side of the runway and that's the result of it. 3AD repaired it, took them 18 months, 15, 18 months. The first time I, an F4 had been repaired outside the manufacturer who were major aircraft depot ever and they're just amazed that the Australian technicians, maintenance guys could do such a great job. And there it is at the finish. Been modified, had a few modifications to the nose, the gun area, and it had equipped with these white lights here, uh, they're, they're formation lights to fly at night, which we used to do a fair bit, close formation at night. And that was the aircraft after they repaired it. And that was the aircraft I'd ferried back from the States with the US Air Force pilot. And it, this crash on the runway, the first flight back in Australia, it was brand new, it had 27 hours on the airframe. Sad sight, but, but they repaired it. Just an interesting digression, US Navy Thunderbirds flew the F-4, F-4E, the top one. The Blue Angels on the second one, F-4C. The only time they ever flew the same aircraft at the same time. The F-4C is an interesting difference, didn't carry a gun. You can see at the front here, it used air-to-air -air missiles. Guys in Vietnam found they wanted a gun because they get right close to MiGs and they couldn't shoot them down. So the F-4E was the result of it and they had a gun sitting right in there and there's the gun barrel there. They used to fly their demonstration aircraft largely with just pilot, single pilot. In this case here, you can see there's a guy in the back. And there's a, the, the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels flying over the Thunderbirds at Nellis Air Force Base. We had to give them back. November 72, that's where they went. Most of them were converted to wild weasels. That's electronic warfare aircraft. Last one, no, 204 was shot down in 2006. They've all gone to the sky hangar. A lot of people wanted to keep the Air Force in Australia and not send them back. We were offered to keep them. The US Air Force said we can have them at a very good price and well, the US government, but we didn't because we didn't have crews to fire them. The crews that were flying there and myself included and other guys were all slated for the F-111. Could have put them down and replaced a Mirage squadron, but they would have had to pull out a disband of Mirage, one of the Mirage squadrons to, to equip with the Phantoms. Then they would have had to find Navs for the back seat. So it just didn't work out. And it didn't have the capability that the F-111 had. We wanted an all-weather strike capability. The F-4 didn't have that. It was strictly a day fighter, but an all-weather interceptor, but a day strike aircraft. Beautiful sound. Two light burners lit. The last landing, an F-4 and US Air Force. 
Mean and ugly. Lots of cartoons came out with the F fours, of course. Because it was a phantom, the obvious one would come out there with the spoof in the top right. The Phantom 2. For our guys, the McDonnell Douglas guys gave us a slouch hat. Tipped up on the left hand side. And you can see other cartoons about here. Complete Air Force, the Phantom in operations at Darwin with the Mirages on the wing. And the cannon. Only carried 654 rounds and the ammunition and the in the gun, so if you fired at full rate, you only had 10 seconds. But at the rate of fire, that was enough to hose and obliterate an aircraft in front of you. The last one. Angel Fire has got a, 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 on Google is a great source of phantom pictures in history. Great historical reference in photographs. If you ever want to go and look at it, you can find it out there. It's a great aircraft, but it had its time. That's it, Marianne. Well, thank you, Lance. That was terrific. Um, uh, look, thanks, Lance. I think once again, having a first person's account of it, uh, I learned so, so much during that. And I love, love the description of it, mean and ugly but it had serviceability, reliability, and, and durability. And I kept thinking to myself, why didn't we keep this aircraft for longer? But you explained that towards the end, that it, it, it sort of ran out of its life. But it seems to be, it was a fantastic aircraft. Um, I think the, uh, I, I had two questions, actually. The internal navigation system, um, internal or, yeah. Um, you were saying that all modern aircraft have that. Was the, the Phantom one a prototype? Was that the first time something like that had been on an aircraft? Uh, from what I recall, certainly on the fighter aircraft, yes. Um, P3Bs had the same uh, system. The basic stable platform oh, unit. Yeah. The navigation yeah. display might have been a bit different. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have a weapons release computer like that that I know of, uh, I'm pretty, if not the first, it was one of the first. <clears throat> and the 111s had an updated version, but basically the same, but the navigation, that's the heart of the system, the navigation display and bombing computer, that they were slightly different, and that, that depended on what the aircraft were. But the basic heart of what's called a, a stabilised platform unit how's the gyros and the accelerometers over the bases they're all much the same yeah um just briefly could you explain what target fixation means <coughs> that there was a well, if you dive a... dive at night and the, uh, uh, whether you get fixed on the target you, in other words it, well doing a 30 degree dive bomb at night the light used to flash at evan's head until the pilot and so i've got the target go steady the RSO would put the light on steady and you'd fly towards the light and you'd, you'd be fixed on the target, not looking about what speed or altitude, critically the altitude that you were. And a lot of guys get fixed on the target and forget about the rest. Mm. So navigators are very, very conscious of that because we had a vested interest in all that to make sure And some guys even had to initiate pull out when they got to about three and a half thousand feet, but the aim which should be pulled out by three, three, three and a half thousand feet mm. at night. We've got to make sure that you, you know what you're doing there. Yeah. Because if you leave it too late, you've had it. Thank you. Um, I think what the, the remarkable sort of come out of that was that the repair job that the groundies did uh, on two, three, four, 
uh, the, the only ones that are fixed up out, outside of manufacture. I think, see, that says a lot about our technicians, doesn't it? I mean, that, that's... It does. It does a good job. And if you speak to David Gardner, he says he did the job. He worked for 3AD as an airframe and then he said he did the whole job himself. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to him about that one. That's great. If you want to with him, he'll know all about it. <laughs> Thanks, Lance. Uh, now, we have a first a question for Captain Frederick. Sir, you had a question you wanted to pose to, uh, to Lance. Hey Lance, um, great presentation, mate. Interesting to hear about an aircraft type that we um, quite often forget about um, in modern times. Most people just don't realise that we flew the Phantoms as we did. Um, my question is, how did we maintain the air-to-air -air refuelling capability after we had the aircraft delivered to Australia, given that we didn't have that capability for a few years? And obviously they were a probe aircraft type, which we, were, we didn't get till we got the KC um 30 so how do we do it or were american air american tankers coming out here regularly to help maintain the skills no, that's the only way yeah they, they came out once or twice but uh, we basically we didn't didn't keep the capability up the, the efficiency up uh we didn't have the capability so so when the aircraft were returned to america were our crews flying no. them back no. okay no the last flight the 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 last 12, uh, it was in one squadron. Dave Rogers was the temporary CO of one squadron with the last 12 Phantoms. And the, the tankers, uh, the 111s arrived, and the next day the Phantoms flew out with the tankers. So it was swap and swap. Wow. There were six 111s in, and the, the last 12 Phantoms out the next day. Okay. So, no, we didn't have any any uh, capability for, for, for the area where we feel in. Uh, it was the thing if you, you're close from eight in an aircraft, you follow, you don't follow the boom, you follow the lights underneath, and you get into position. Yeah, that's where you get, stay there, fly. One of the pilots you always used to be, I used to give him a running commentary where the boom was because <laughs> it was like just above my head, whether you're in the green or the amber. And uh, but some pilots used to get a bit frantic about it, but the aim was. Just fly the aircraft under the director lights under the tanker and you'll be right. And let the boom operator put the put put the, the probe into the receptacle. One of them, one of our blokes, I won't tell who, uh, broke the boom and had to return the aircraft to, to St. Louis. Uh, he didn't have a lot of practice at it, but he buggered the buggered the air refilling door because you if you can't shut that, you can't pressurize the tanks. Okay. How did you go then when the F-111 turned up, um, obviously, you know, you talk about as the navigator in the back seeing the boom goes straight over your head and obviously the F-111 you're side by side. So was there, no, I suppose the fact that you guys didn't do much air to air refueling with the F-4 probably didn't really make much of a difference then? No, uh, it, it, we did, <clears throat> with the 111 we did air refueling in USA and we didn't do it again until, well, by the, by the time we got tankers to do it. But the, the 111 didn't need it mostly. Um, the F4 did, although we could fly to Perth without air refueling uh, via Alice Springs. Uh, so, no, there wasn't any practice at it at all. Uh, certainly with the 111s, if we go to Rimpac, Hawaii, we used to do some, but not a lot, no. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Great, great presentation again. Well done, mate. Um, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, anyone got anyone any other questions? Just put your hand up. Yes, sir. yes, Andrew. Yeah, Lance. Uh, yeah, great, great presentation. Um, uh, that that sector from uh, uh, Honolulu to Guam, I think, was what seven seven and a half hours or so. Obviously, involved quite a few uh, refuels. Yep. And you would have been earning your money as a navigator, I guess, in the event of any... Con what sort of contingency planning did you have if something, for instance, like a, a boom was damaged or the door, you know, obviously approaching fuel station, etc. The The principle that the, the... The whole flight was managed by the... Uh, what was called the AUFT, the Air Refueling Group in Hawaii, whatever the number was, I've forgotten. 45th, 27th or something. They so we feel the, the the navigators on the tankers used to do the navigation for the flight. They would maintain and they would call in the receivers, as, as we were called, call in the receivers to fill up with fuel, 
to give us enough fuel to divert to uh, put diversion uh, along the way back to the base we left Hawaii or along to Midway or onto yeah. Wake as a diversion or to make sure we had enough fuel to go to any of those places either return yep. divert to Wake or Midway or go on to Guam okay. so we had enough fuel there so the navigators really sat back for the ride we used to give the tank the tanker navigators the an inertial navigation position just to check his because because he didn't have inertial navigation. They had Doppler and Sun Gun and all that section. Yeah, yeah. Now they used to just they used to ask us to confirm their position. And the map for three thousand seven hundred miles was about that I had in the cockpit was about eighteen inches long. <laughs> and uh, so there's nothing in the ocean. The navigation computer did it all. A lot, lot of blue. He would have had his plotting chart, and that was about that was it, basically. Yep. If if you did have if you did have one of those fuel problems and you diverted, was the plan just to go as a solo, or would you take two of you and well, get off the wake or midway or whatever? Generally, it was uh, well, yeah, a good question. Um, when in the flight that I did from Hawaii to Guam, there were only two Aussies, <clears throat> anyway, and there were two two Americans. If one of us diverted, I think we would have diverted and the other one would have gone on. <clears throat> yep. The hardest thing there was the people say, how did you last that long with the toilet breaks? <clears throat> well, that's a good question. You didn't. <laughs> well, the, the Americans used to make, they used to manage things very well. Everybody was, all crews were put on a low residue diet for a day and a half, two days before. And you had pedal packs anyway. <clears throat> And 111s had all that, still have all that. So the problem still exists. You just got to manage it yourself properly. Fascinating. Fascinating. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it had years of practice that <laughs> cameras are the same. <clears throat> I think that, that's why they don't let 52 year old blokes like me fly, uh, fly those sorts of things anymore. I'd need a break every 15 minutes. Age is a factor, of course. <laughs> Our bladders aren't what they used to be. I must say, I was wondering about that bit myself, actually. So that's right. Definitely no one um, met a musical the night before, that's for sure. It's manageable, yeah. Mary Ann, it's manageable. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, do we have any more questions there? If you want to put your hand up, yes, through Captain Norfolk, sir. And then Phil, then we'll go, Phil. Yeah, I'll let Phil go. Uh, Phil? Um, thank you, and Lance, a uh, really interesting presentation again. Um, my, I've got two questions, actually, if I can indulge you. The first one, though, is um, you had a bit of an interesting progression having trained on the F-111 and then gone back to the Phantom. Normally, it would be the other way around. And I'm just wondering what you thought about that uh, when you did go on to the Phantom. Well, when I trained on the 111 straight after Vietnam, we trained the 111, then we came back to Australia and then went back to the Canberra, and that was a very big backdrop, going from a Cadillac to the old Meteor-equipped uh, instrument aircraft, very awful. And then going to the Phantom, <clears throat> uh, the instrumentation was much the same. The performance was better than the 111, probably. Well, it, it, was, a, it was a fighter, there's no question. The 111 wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a major problem. The hardest problem was going back to the camera. <laughs> I was thinking more in terms of the, the capability of the systems that you had and the, the technology involved. Uh, <clears throat> it was a quite a different transgression. It was back to fighter pilot stuff, four ship formation, fighter pilot briefing, standard CFS briefing, all that. We never did all that in the 111 stuff. We were all single operators uh, initially. Uh, it's a bit of a bit hard to come by everywhere you went to the four ship. Um, but it, it's capable. It didn't have, it, it was a good day strike air fast dive bomber. It was good at that. And that's what it was for. We did a lot of air inter intercept work as well. Um, self set up, so with MCRU at 114, or up, up and down with the control system up there. We trained as interceptor navigators as well as interceptor pilots. The pilots knew what it was all about because they had a lot of them Mirage trained. <clears throat> it was the new game, the new ballpark to us. We did a bit of that on 111s as well, but we didn't use it as an interceptor. Uh, yeah, it was, it was different. 
This is a different world. There's no question. It was a different world. We used to fly over at 510 knots, regardless. <laughs> um, one of them used to fly at 480. Canvas used to fly at 350. So there's a bit of a bit of a change, but uh, it's all relative. The Please. system weren't as good. That's all. Well, my second question was actually going to be about the air-to-air -air capability, but you've answered that. So it had an excellent air-to-air. -air. It was an air interceptor. It was an AI radar, and we can. We used to come right up behind the aircraft. You get what's called a visual ident meter. You'd come right up to a thousand feet behind an aircraft, and some the time they wouldn't even know you were there. <clears throat> and that was the rules of engagement. They had to do a visual identification before you pull back. You could fire the gun or fire the uh, infrared missiles or the sparrows. We didn't get sparrows. The Americans did. We had the, the sidewinders and the gun. So depending on how close you had to get close up to them behind them. But visual identifier before you pull back to gun range or back to sidewinder range. That would only practice that, of course. But the Yanks used that earnest in Vietnam. But the air interceptors, that was what it was, and it did it very, very well. Lance, Pete Norford. Hey, Pete. And um, you, you made reference to uh, no more F-4s, our F-4s, the 24 that we had, no more gone. They were turned into uh, drones and, uh, and targets and bits and pieces. Um, uh, do you the rear aircraft initially, Pete, and then drones, yeah. Yeah. Air Vice Marshal Reid, God bless him, um, um, it was, was chasing us you know, up until recently, uh, before he before he uh, passed away, um, about, about chasing um, aeroplanes in the boneyard at Montham, which is he, he reckons there's two of ours that were left in Montham. Is is, is you know, is there any uh, any truth to that, Rama? I yeah, I don't I don't know I don't know the answer to that, Pat. Uh, okay, I just, I just, just Rogers might. I can always check with him, but Dave Rogers is usually right on this because he's Mr. Phantom in the Air Force, our Air Force. Yeah, <laughs> I'll check with Dave. We we're just curious. You know, there was all sorts of wild dreams to uh, to go and, you know, the the, uh, the Hellenic slash Greek Air Force were flying them up until relatively recently, and uh, we had uh, you know pipe dreams to go and pick up one of theirs off a uh, off a runway in uh, in Athens or somewhere and bring one home. Well, as you know, we've got one down at the uh, the strike hangar at Point Cook, but yeah. that's not one of ours. No, that's a, a later version with leading edge slats. Yeah. Which ours didn't have. Uh, so on that basis, I think they probably couldn't get one of ours. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was a gift. That that one was a gift. But uh, I'm, I'm trying to, in some ways, run down the uh, the truth of uh, whether there is any of our F4s left. I don't know. I I'll I check with Dave Rogers. He'd know. Uh, he's a font of knowledge on all things fandom. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next, next time I see him, I'll, uh, I'll chase him up. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I see him. Every, well, I, don't, I see him every week until the COVID came in. Um, and, and my other comment, Lance, is I was surprised having ferried uh, phantoms across the uh, the Pacific at 500 knots. You then went on to do an advanced nav course. I find that quite ironic. <laughs> well, I didn't learn much on the advanced nav course. I must admit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then I went from there. As nav instructor at two FTS, and we went back into the Guinea Bird as a sound navigator. <laughs> 140 knots versus 500. Uh, it's all relative. I must admit, I did enjoy getting in the Guinea Bird. I could get up and go and have a leak down the back and have a cup of coffee, but I couldn't do it in the <laughs> uh, Yeah, it's, it's speeds relative. Hey, Lance. Um, so, you sort of alluded to the fact that there was still the bit of repartee, I'll put it politely, between you guys and the fighter guys and the mirages. Any other stories you can tell us from those times about, because um, obviously that still continues to this day between the, the Hornet guys and the Super Hornet guys. So Probably less so now. <clears throat> the guys are always... We used to back on flying the F-11s, we used to fly the F-11s in air, air defence exercises. Our instructions were to fly medium altitude with the anti-collision light on. People said, hang on, that's not how we fly. Oh, that's to give the Mirage guys or the Hornets, uh, Mirage is in my time, it, be able to pick you up to give them some practice. Because <laughs> otherwise they'd never see us. 
never find us because that's if you operate then the way that you, you make sure that that wouldn't happen that, that you were low in the weeds at night in bad weather and most of the knuckleheads couldn't get down there anyway didn't ever look down shoot down capability uh, and if they could find us they wouldn't want to get too bloody low because we were too low so <clears throat> Yeah, there's a lot of repartee about all that. I don't. I think it's probably less so now because of the aircraft, similar aircraft types. Uh, but yeah, I can't. Don't know what's going. The situation is now. Okay. And then we had the strike reconnaissance group and then the fighter force. And they were two different people. Now they're all combined. Yep. So that makes a big difference. And Lance, if it makes you feel any better, the fighter guys had the same problem with the Iroquois helicopters as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I've, yeah, well, I could bet they could, because you guys used to fly right in the weeds, six <laughs> feet above the bloody sand. I remember that. <laughs> I know in the podcast that we organised with the fighter pilot podcast people, and um, Leo Davies and Mero were interviewed, and they were talking about the fact that the F one eleven guys used to fly along. This was before they had the EW suite put on there, and they were. They were saying it was quite interesting that the Mirage guys would always come in one way because it was a blind spot, and there was an upgrade to the kit for the F-111. And next minute, the F-111 guys couldn't, uh, the Mirage guys couldn't work out why they were always being picked up by the F-111 guys and started manoeuvring before they could get into the right situation. And it was like, well, we've got this new kit, and that's why. And apparently, they had to change the whole approach. The this folklore the Mirage guys had of this is how you get an F-111 had to change overnight. Oh, I don't know what that could have been. Um, uh, I was a project officer on the 111 upgrade to the, with the PAVE TAC, but that was a grand attack system and a laser system. That was forward looking, all, all the hemisphere, but yeah. maybe they used that to find it, check out the rear. I don't, I don't know how. Yeah. What I'll, have to, I'll have to go back and listen to the podcast again. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know. You can't American to that. Um, Leo Davies and um, Stephen Merida. So D cast the ex chief. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that. Happened. It must have been. I was talking to Steve Merida a few weeks ago about the, the systems that we had. That, that I was a, pardon me, <clears throat> the project officer on. That, that was the pay tax system, and he reckoned it was that was great. But that was for ground attack. So maybe he was doing something with that. We'll and have to get your hemisphere. Or hemisphere. We'll have to get you back to present on the F-111 because um, you know, Mero tells the story of as a navigator and the tricks they used to play when they were flying straight at hills and doing a pull-up and then tr trusting the terrain following radar. And he said the first time he put his head up and saw this mountaintop coming at him, he quickly decided it was smarter just to put his head back down inside and not worry about what the pilot was doing. He said, let the pilot do his pilot stuff so he wouldn't worry about this hill that was rapidly approaching him. Well, as I was advised by my first CO on 111th, Ray Fennell, <clears throat> I worry about the vertical navigation, you worry about the horizontal navigation. <laughs> <clears throat> you fly it, you get me there. <clears throat> and we used to run all the weapons side, of course, and, and, and weapons selection, weapons tar targeting. The pilot would fly the aircraft, but he'd have release consent. He said, I've got the last button, the release consent button. <laughs> With the, with the F4, what was the forward visibility like for you in the back seat? Bloody awful. Mm. Couldn't see much. Uh, did one landing from the back seat, which was pretty difficult. You had to weave a bit to see. Uh, you couldn't do a straight in approach. You had to weave, weave to see the runway and then bring the aircraft back. <coughs> pretty difficult. <coughs> uh, it's doable, but not. <coughs> Not recommended. <clears throat> the best part about the, the Phantom also had two ejection seats, rocket seats. <clears throat> if the pilot initiated an ejection, the navigator would go first <clears throat> and then pilot. If the navigator initiated ejection, he'd go. The pilot wouldn't <clears throat> until you had a command select valve, <clears throat> which you could turn where you could eject the pilot as well. <clears throat> And that was implemented in Vietnam when guys in the back seat of a jump eject, but he wouldn't know if the pilot was alive or dead. <clears throat> so he had the option of ejecting the pilot as well, but always after the navigator. So was that through the canopy or did the canopy go first? Oh, the canopy go. Okay. 
Never tried it. <laughs> it's a zero zero capability. You can push you up to four hundred feet. Um, it was quite exhilarating, I believe, but I never no never tried it. <clears throat> uh, it was a, it was a different aircraft, but it was built like a bit like a battleship, the F four. It was, it was the typical Navy, US Navy airplane. It didn't have any finesse or any human factors engineering like the F 11 did. <clears throat> it was a British and uncouth aircraft. It had built for a job and it did it very, very well. <clears throat> so, obviously, it had the folding wingtips for the United States Navy design. Yes. Would we ever use that or no. do we have them always locked in place down? No, we didn't, didn't fold. No. Okay. <clears throat> the interesting thing, a lot of the fans, we used to do what was well, when we were flying in, in they build, they used to fly so many sorties in Florida to do hot refueling. The landing come in there, shut one engine down, refuel the aircraft with the other one still running, take a taxi back to the lines and ready to go again. And that's how they used to operate. <clears throat> now they just bring the tankers around and fill her up. <clears throat> or we got underground refueling now, of course. The hot refueling was uh, was the go then. That was something else. We not, could, just couldn't get used to all that. No, it was exhilarating aircraft, but limited, uh, limited range, limited, but it was brutish and uncouth. <laughs> All right, you have a question. Yes, yes sir. What, what was the endurance uh, in the F4? How many hours? Well, really dependent on the flight profile um, and what, what tanks you had. Uh, we to, normal sorties, going, what we did operate with two 370-gallon tanks out of Amley, we'd be 1.7 to two hours. Ferry range, a bit different. Ferry, for, we could fly from um, Amley to Alice Springs with a 600-gallon tank down to PS. We certainly flew from uh, PS to Edinburgh, no problem, Edinburgh back to Amley. So you're looking at about three and a half hours with a big 600-gallon tank. Ferry configuration, fl flying for, for range, which is still about 510 knots. <clears throat> so it depends really what you want to going to do with it. Because it usually lose a lot of fuel. And especially with fuel flow meters used to go off the clocks when you're doing Mark 2.2. <laughs> and it flew extremely well at Mark 2.2, clean. <clears throat> eight and a half G, and everybody's ever pulled eight and a half G, you really know it. The aircraft was so strong in Vietnam, one of our blokes pulled ten and a half with the JCs. Uh, I won't say who that was. <clears throat> uh, an American one in Vietnam pulled 13 and a half G, still flew, busted a lot of rivets, flew, never flew again, but it flew back to Tarkley or something. So it was a very tough aircraft. Yeah. You're mentioning IRS, IRS earlier. The INS, um, which I think you had in, in, the deck, uh, in our airliners here in the early 60s, and then you went to the IRS, the initial reference system, which had laser ring gyros. So that was the 737s, you know, the 727s, the older INS, and the Eversight. I don't know what the Civi aircraft had. They're now called inertial measurement units, and they're, they're co located with the Central Air Data Computer System. With the modern, more modern aircraft. I don't know about civil, but the military aircraft. They used to have separate CAD system, central air data system, stabilized platform unit. Now they're all combined and then they've got laser, laser ring gyros there now. An inertial measurement unit, they call them. I don't know what the civvies call them. IRS are after the infrared seeker at the back. But the inertial reference system, yeah. And they were the heart of the system. And the same with the 111. And that provided the primary attitude, the navigation, the whole lot, and the normal old compass system was a secondary system. That both aircraft had three reference systems. Uh, 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 <clears throat> And that was that was it. But it's been fine everything, technology, but the basic concepts, the physical concepts are the same. Thank you, Lance, and thanks for that question, Mark. Has anyone got any other questions they'd like to pose to yes, Bill? 
Um, so just to follow on from that, Lance, um, what sort of drift did you get out of the uh, INS? Uh, fairly high. <laughs> the one level was the same. We used to get uh, used to drift until we got dop we didn't have Doppler damping or anything like that in the one level or the Phantom. Uh, if, if, after an hour, hour and a half, sorry, two hours, one eleven three, you get about five or six miles, something seven hours, miles hour. One eleven, you get updated all the time. Phantom, you couldn't. So you used so to those Trans Pacific ferries, you would have had a fair bit of drift at the end of each leg. Yeah, but it was still about six, seven mi miles out when we got to Hawaii. But uh, we, once you got within TACAN range, you didn't worry about that. You just relied on the TACAN for the thermal, uh, thermal system or precision approach radar if you needed it. <clears throat> yeah, it had a bit of a drift rate, yeah. In the F111, could you update using the radar? Yes. And or TACAN with a raw front or more visual. You can update position, present position or destination in the F111. <clears throat> do either. You can do everything in the F111. It's a Cadillac. Step out of the bathroom, perhaps. Well, we have a kettle pack. Always comes back to that, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if there is any other questions, um coming from the floor thank you well look thanks once again lance and i hope adam is suitably impressed with, <laughs> with, with you i'm sure he's uh i'm sure he is and uh, uh, it was very good um so you know appreciate the opportunity to check in with that uh, marianne and dad and oh, the presentation right. and uh you know obviously brings back some memories that not that i was alive when they were flying but uh, when dad was uh, part of the part of the um the crew, uh, but we still, I mean, in, in my place now, I even have a, a replica that uh, of the Australian version that sits in my son's room, uh, who's now down at uh, Sale actually doing his um, his training. So, uh, oh, that's right. Yes, we, yes, we, we, um, Lance was telling me about him, he's doing well. That's wonderful. It is indeed. So, it's certainly part of our uh, family history and uh, will remain so. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's well, never stop talking about it, probably. <laughs> well, that's that, that part too, but you know, we, uh, we deal with that. <laughs> well, there's certainly something about being a, you know, being a child of a, of a RAF person. You know, there's a certain excitement in everything they do, and you know, you feel feel very, you know, compared to all those boring city kids. That, um, you know, oh, absolutely. Dead, I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, back in the day, I never, I mean, I never personally saw the camera or heard the camera flying, but. Um, you know, on the base in Amberley when I was probably about five years old. I still remember the f 11s coming and going, so that was always uh, very exciting. And Santa Claus coming down to the the, the preschool and uh, in the Iroquois and dropping off the presents for us and those yeah, sorts of things. So it's a, it's a unique, unique um, yeah. experience to grow up with. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I can remember. I can actually remember. I don't know where it was. Was Santa coming down to a parachute? All the kids were screaming until he actually made it. But that was it. Was it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yeah, now, now, now I see Santa Claus coming in at uh, coming in on a jet ski at Bondi Beach on Christmas Day. So that's <laughs> quite, quite a contrast. Yeah, that's right, exactly. No, that's wonderful. That's North, great. Thanks, North's Adam. probably got stories about Santa Claus and CT fours flying at the trees of the sail. <laughs> yeah. North, North wasn't on that, was he? <laughs> Uh, I, I do remember some of those Jubilee uh, flyovers too, um, Lance, and um, yeah, they're pretty impressive. But you know, um, that was that was great fun, and we used to do the dive attack and the Jubilee displays, and uh, dive that with a pseudo gunnery pass, and yeah, that was good fun. Yeah. Well, look, once again, Lance, thank you very much. You've you've you know, um, as um, as a as an operator, as so experienced, and it's just really, it really brings it alive. And the fantastic group of photos, I might say, too, it's really terrific. Thanks, and uh, I hope you're writing your memoirs. I think um, maybe that's what you're uh, discussing with uh, Group Captain Fredo. I hope so, because that online experience, you know, um, is just invaluable. invaluable. And, I, and I hope we're getting you interviewed as well, Group Captain Fredericks. So put, uh, I'll put Lance's name down some time ago to be interviewed, and you really must be. So look, thank you very much um, once again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've got a good program coming up for the rest of the year. So um, 
And what else is there to do in lockdown other than uh, uh, Zoom presentations and learn more, learn, learn things um, about the fandom? I've certainly learned a lot today. So thank you very much for, for participating.